Hi, Michelle. Oh, I'm sorry, you're muted. There you are. Hi there, how's it going? Hi, I'm Will, how are you? I am doing well. Um, I'm trying something. I'm curious if this is gonna work. I'm trying to uh, log in. I'm, I'm logged in on my laptop right now so I can be in full presentation mode, but I can't see the chat when I'm in this mode, so I was going to try to log into my desktop kind of as a secondary device to see if I can see the chat and respond that way. <laughs> uh, I don't know if that's going to work, but I'm going to give it a little. Do you can you hear me, Michelle? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you see my video? Yes. Can you see the okay. screen? Can you see the slides right now? Uh, yes, I do. Um, if you, um, Michelle, if you go to where my name is, and if you see the three little dots on the right, I believe that's where you can get grant me the captioning privileges. Oh, okay, perfect. And you know what? I want to make sure. Okay, so it says assign to type closed caption. Is that you? That's me. There you are. Okay, I'm going to do a test. Okay. So can you turn on your closed captions on your end? Or maybe Tara Morris, can you please turn on your closed captioning? And then I'm going to do a test run so that way you guys can confirm that you see me. Yes. Give me one. Yes. So how do we how do we do that? Uh, you turn go to the caption. bottom. There's a little bar and then you see their CC and then you just click on that and then it should turn, you can uh, turn them on. Okay, let me see. I do not see that. Okay, give me one second. Not seeing it either. Um. We know we're recording right now, too. Okay, so to the bottom where you see participants, share screen, where you have that little bar, you guys don't see a little CC? I do see it now. So show oh. subtitle, full, beautiful transcript it. or subtitle setting. There, go to show subtitles and you should see me. I'm going to start writing. You should see my caption. Um, yes. Yes. Testing. Okay, perfect. Okay, I'll stand by. Thank you so much. Thanks, Alexa. We appreciate you being here today. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Just one quick question, Alexa. Should I keep that option on or is that just 
based on the participant? Well, you can leave them on if you want to follow, but it, that's more for the participant. Um, the same direction that you guys did right now, you can just explain that to them at the uh, intro. Okay. But you don't have to leave it on unless you want to. Got it. Thank you. And just to clarify, it's called um, show subtitles. Uh huh. Okay, perfect. I think that's how she read it. Okay. Oh, lastly, Michelle, uh, can you tell me who the speakers will be so I can get the correct spelling? Yeah, so we have two speakers today, myself and then uh, Tara Morris, who is also on the call right now. You should be able to see her name in the video tile. Perfect. Thank you. Of course. Um, so Tara, I'm not sure if we are making this recording available. I think I went ahead and enabled recording when I created the meeting just so we would have it in the event they wanted to share. But I haven't confirmed that with Mallory. Have you heard anything about the uh, she did make she did say on the meeting yesterday, make sure you hit record. Okay. So I'm not sure yeah. in what format it will be distributed. Uh, because I I can't say I've seen it go through like the listservs or anything in the past, but maybe that's what she envisions. I think just to archive it is my guess. Okay. So let's see. So I'm logged in uh, on my PC as well, so I can monitor the chat because when I'm in full screen presentation mode on my laptop, I lose that feature. So I'll be um, able to do both. It's like inception okay. over here. Okay. I look like an alien with my green screen. No, I love it. It's got a fruit <laughs> to it.
Should we go ahead and get started? Yeah, it's a minute um, past. So why don't we go ahead and jump right in while others uh, kind of get set up. Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Uh, we're excited to have you here today. My name is Michelle White. I'm a senior researcher with the RP group. Um, and today we'll be presenting a qualitative exploration of AB705, which will include sharing the findings and recommendations from the statewide interviews conducted last year. Um, just a quick note, we do have closed captioning for today's webinar. So if you're interested in that, you can go to your Zoom toolbar and enable the subtitles there, uh, and you should have closed captioning options. Um, I'm joined by my colleague. Uh, she and I were both part of the interview team for this study. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to her to introduce herself and kick us off. Thank you, Michelle. Hi, everybody. My name is Tara Morris, and I am a research analyst with the Multiple Me Measures Assessment Project uh, with the RP Group. And uh, we're going to tell you about our uh, qualitative study that we've been working on for the last year um, related to AB705 and um, putting a voice to AB705 implementation across the state. So the first thing we're gonna do for our, our agenda today, we're gonna give you an overview of the project and the methodology, and then we'll provide you um, a review of the key findings by each of the five, six focus areas for our project. Uh, decisions around the placement rules uh, colleges used, positive outcomes of AB 705 implementation, challenges with implementation, students' capacity to succeed, uh, how colleges are supporting students and addressing equity gaps in enrollment and throughput. And then we'll follow that up with some recommendations and interactive um, sort of session where we'll get some feedback from you and then some questions. And if you have questions during the presentation, you can add them uh, to the chat and Michelle and I will each try to answer what we can through the chat, and then we'll, uh, we can do some at the end. So for our study, um, as everybody I'm sure knows, starting in fall 2019, uh, Assembly Bill 705 went into effect that required uh, California community colleges to maximize the likelihood that students would complete transfer level math and English um, requirement related to their educational goal within a one year time frame. And so we wanted to interview colleges uh, for a couple of reasons. The first was to better understand the factors 
that are influencing the different levels and approaches to implementation. The second was to be able to inform the chancellor's office and colleges across the state of the different challenges and needs that have resulted from AB 705 implementation. And the final thing was to identify promising results or practices to support colleges in their efforts to continuously improve student outcomes and lessen equity gaps. So our methodology for today, uh, or for our project, so we conducted interviews via Zoom um, in February through March 2020. And so the interviews happened right before um, colleges started transitioning to online. Um, and so during those interviews, so the interviews really are focusing on colleges experiences in fall 2019 and the beginning of the spring 2020 semester. So for our project, we interviewed 83 individuals who came from 14 colleges. And these individuals were selected um, by college representatives um, for playing a key role in the AB 705 implementation on their campus. And for the college selection process, we used a stratified random sample and selected two colleges from each of the seven Vision for Success regions. Uh, one college from the region with 85% or more of math and English sections offered at transfer level in fall 2019, and one college per region with 65% or fewer uh, math and English sections offered at transfer level in fall 2019. So for the colleges that um, so graciously participated in our project. Um, here are the seven regions with each of the colleges that were selected in each of the seven regions. In the next slide, uh, you'll see the participants by their primary role at the college. So we had a total of 57 faculty members uh, participate in the study. And about 40% of the faculty members were department chairs at the time of the interviews. Um, we also had administrators such as vice presidents of instruction, deans in instruction, uh, vice president of student services, and some assessment uh, folks. So the first area we're going to talk about is our first focus area. Um, in the project. And we wanted to know how did colleges decide about what placement rules to use, whether to go with the default placement rules or to use a localized rule set. So on the next slide, we really had two questions about this. So how did colleges determine the rules that they're currently using and what factors influence the rules, the college's decisions? So most colleges created an AB 705 committee uh, that was made up of faculty from multiple disciplines, uh, including math, English, ESL, counseling. Um, we had student senate or academic senate leaders on the committees, uh, student equity representatives, assessment, um, people from all across campus. Now, most of the colleges that we spoke with ended up allowing or letting the faculty have the deciding vote about the types of placement rules they would be using for their discipline. So math faculty having the deciding vote for math and English uh, for the English rule, placement rules. And uh, most of the colleges said the administration supported their decision. So in terms of what influenced their decisions on the type of placement rules, um, statewide data was one of the things that got brought up uh, quite a bit. So colleges looked at the default placement rates and pulled uh, many times pulled local throughput data and compared their local rates to the default rate um, and also looked at other multiple measures assessment project findings. And we also found that uh, colleges that had participated in prior initiatives that were focused on shortening sequences and increasing support uh, were more likely to go with the default placement rules. So those initiatives included the California Assessment Project, um, ESL integration, 
and uh, colleges that had Title V grants or uh, BSOC grants. So throughout the presentation, we're going to give you some of our main themes and findings, but we're also going to um, put a voice to some of the themes that we're seeing in terms of presenting you quotes um, that came out of the interviews. So one math faculty at a college that decided to use the default placement rules said using the default placement rules allowed us to simplify things. All students can automatically enroll in transfer level with co-requisite support. Another math department chair said, math faculty agreed it would be difficult to increase the student's likelihood of completing transfer level math within one year if students were required to start with algebra. So each of these quotes come from, um, one comes from a college with 80% or more of transfer level courses in fall 19, and one is from a college with 65% or fewer. Uh, now in this slide, we have, uh, so 100% of the colleges that came from, that had 80, offered 80% 80 or more of transfer level sections in fall 19, decided to use the default placement rules. Um, for the colleges with 65% or fewer sections, four of the colleges used the default rules and three colleges used a localized rule set. Now these are quotes from the colleges that used local rules. Uh, our unique student population and number of non-traditional students we serve influenced our decision to keep one level below and to use our own local placement rules. And a math chair said, our college felt it was important to utilize the two-year probation period to pilot our local rules. So our next second focus area is about the positive outcomes that um, the interviewee saw from AB705 implementation on their campus. So we had a lot of positive outcomes that were brought out and these were the, the most common themes that we saw. The first was an increase in student centeredness. So college re colleges reported simplified placement processes um, they found that the guided, guided and self-placement process, they saw that students were taking ownership of their starting placement level. Um, and we had a number of counselors and faculty that brought up about um, allowing, providing students access to transfer level in their first year, uh, allows students to save time and money in the long run. Uh, the next outcome was development of new curriculum. So colleges created, shortened their sequences in math and English and ESL. Um, more colleges uh, have embedded support in their transfer level courses. And we saw an increase in co-requisite support courses uh, for transfer level math and English classes. Uh, folks also um, Said they saw an increase in collaboration and communication across campus. And that happened within their own disciplines with faculty having informal conversations, uh, talking about teaching practices or support models and what's working and not working with their peers within their department, but also across uh, disciplines with uh, greater communication between say math and English departments and ESL departments um, and counseling, for example. Another positive outcome is the development of new strategies. Uh, faculty said they're coming up with new teaching strategies um, and new support models to really help students be successful in the transfer level math and English courses. And uh, the next uh, positive outcome is improved academic outcomes. And this was brought up by all of the colleges. Uh, colleges saw an increase in access to transfer level. Um, most saw an increase in success or success rates maintaining compared to prior terms. Um, and most of the colleges reported an increase in throughput rates. So I'll read a quote um, from a counselor at one of the colleges who said, our college saw an increase of 750 plus students 
complete transfer level math this fall compared to the prior academic year. Over half of the students who completed transfer level were Hispanic compared to only 30% the prior year. And an English faculty said, there's an increase in dialogue around student success, teaching and learning after implementing AB 705. So that moves us to our third focus area, and that was challenges with AB 705 implementation. And I'm sure as people can guess, there were a lot of challenges that um, came out of the interviews, and we're going to present the most common themes that we saw. So the first theme is about ensuring sufficient buy-in. Um, this was buy-in in terms of faculty buying into AB 705, administrators, students, uh, feeder schools within the district and the community. Um, we're used to taking tests and having an assessment test to tell us where students should start. And so this change in uh, placement um, requires a lot of communication uh, in order to get everybody on board. And we found that um, buy-in was one of the biggest challenges with implementation. Another challenge was operational issues. Uh, challenges with the student registration system, um, with co-requisite courses and the core course, linking the course or not linking the course in the system, um, support models, not knowing what is the best way to support students, and um, enrollment challenges. There are also challenges with providing student support. Um, Students who have optional support or access to it aren't always utilizing that support. Um, another big challenge was availability of data. Um, mo almost all of the colleges said timely access to meaningful data in order to support data-driven decisions was a challenge. Uh, another challenge was communication, making sure that uh, accurate and consistent messaging is going out. Um, to students, to faculty, to staff, to feeder schools. Um, another was about sharing best practices. A lot of the um, folks that we talked to said that they felt like they're working sort of in a silo and they don't know what others are doing and what's working and not working and they really want um, to hear more about what are some of the best practices for other folks um, implementing AB 705. And the final thing is professional development and resource needs, uh, which I'll go into a little bit more on the next slide. So these were things that got brought up quite a bit. So one was uh, professional development needs. Um, most of the faculty said that they would, they would like to have professional development about teaching multiple levels of preparedness in the classroom. Um, faculty said they need professional development to implement AB 705 fully and effectively. And one of those things was about um, how to assess students' gaps in knowledge and to provide quality teaching to fill in those gaps while having multiple levels of preparedness in one class. Uh, the, the other professional development needs were about incorporating soft skills into the regular classroom content. Um, some faculty said they wanted some refreshers on teaching transfer level courses um, where and this was particularly for statistics and English composition. Um, we had faculty saying they weren't sure how to utilize embedded tutors in the classroom. So they want to have embedded tutors but aren't quite sure the best way to use them in the classroom. And one theme that got brought up over and over was to make sure that part-time faculty are included in all professional development needs. Uh, part-time faculty tend to teach a lot of the entry-level courses, gateway courses that, faculty, that students are um, first enrolling in. And part-time counselors are some of the first points of contact for many students. And the next thing is resource and funding needs. Uh, funding tutors, tutor training, and tutor coordination. Um, colleges reported an all-time high of tutor requests on campus, 
And uh, that's created a, a lot of work and in finding tutors and training tutors and pairing tutors with faculty. Um, funding for professional development, funding for informational technology and institutional research. Uh, colleges reported that their um, IT and IR offices were understaffed. And um, in some cases, it, that created a challenge in terms of fully implementing AB 705. And the final thing was faculty stipends uh, to compensate part-time faculty to participate in professional development, to create new curriculum for shorter sequences, to create co-requisite support courses, and to now convert um, courses into online um, instruction and also support workshops for students. So just, I'm gonna read just one of these quotes on here. Um, and all of them are related to um, not being able to provide enough support for students or not knowing how to get students to access the support that's provided. Um, so one counselor says budget is the biggest restraint to not being able to give students everything they need to be successful. Budget limits the number of sections with support the department can offer. And many students who need support are not able to enroll in a section with support. Uh, and a dean of liberal arts says we're worried we don't have enough safety net for students who need more time and support. So for focus area four and on, I'm gonna hand it over to Michelle. Thank you so much. So focus area four had to do with students' capacity to succeed in transfer level English and math. And we know that AB 705 sparked a lot of discussion around student preparedness and students' ability to meet course requirements. Um, so this was an important area for us to explore. So when we learned, uh, when we spoke to colleges about this particular topic, um, we learned four kind of main takeaways. Um, the first being that the conversation with students has changed. So students now hear that um, they can enter transfer level courses right away. Um, any student who feels like they might be underprepared or are uncertain in their abilities um, to complete transfer level work in their first year, uh, get that reassurance that they're capable um, and they'll receive the support they need from the college. Uh, next, uh, colleges reported that they believe students are capable of successfully completing transfer level math and English in their first year if they have concurrent support and wraparound services available. Um, so support courses, co-requisite uh, classes, and infrastructure were key to successful implementation. We also learned from colleges um, that some individuals still fear AB 705 may um, hurt students who truly need basic skills courses. Uh, they express concern that eliminating these remedial courses um, may prevent the college from being able to accommodate different skill levels. Um, so some interviewees wondered, will these changes we're experiencing from AB 705 um, allow us to continue to meet the diverse needs of the community. Uh, and lastly, we learned that there are many non-academic barriers that affect a student's ability to succeed, not just in transfer level courses, but really all courses. Uh, and these included things like um, work obligations, family responsibilities, uh, health concerns. Um, these can create you know, competing priorities that uh, pose a threat to student success. So um, especially from faculty, um, we learned that uh, if we don't um, address these kind of non-academic factors, um, there's really no guarantee we're gonna see uh, the throughput um, and enrollment increases that we'd like to see. Uh, so what we heard um, when we spoke to colleges was that um, for many, the mindset is shifting from are the students college ready to is the college student ready? So some of the things we heard um, from an assessment coordinator, the college is now treating all students as having the capacity to complete transfer level courses. 
Um, so that goes a long way when the student can feel that support from their college. Uh, giving students more autonomy can often be empowering for students. So students feel empowered by having more choice and control over the classes they take. Um, so this is kind of hand in hand with the guided self-placement process. Um, students have more ownership uh, in terms of their education. Um, so rather being told what they're going to be permitted to take, um, they now have kind of um, a stake in the process. And then AB 705 provided an opportunity for the college to create new placement policies, procedures, pathways, and support services with an equity lens. Uh, members of the Student Equity Committee also served on the AB 705 Committee. So this is from um, a director of student equity. Uh, so for many colleges, AB 705 was the impetus um, to re-examine kind of longstanding placement policies uh, from an equity perspective. All right, so focus area five had to do with how best to support students in transfer level English and math. Um, and what we found when we asked colleges this question uh, was really three main things. So the first being um, most of the colleges said that they're offering some sort of co-requisite support courses. Um, this is often a course that's taught by uh, the same instructor um, and in the same classroom we learned. Uh, faculty reported that um, this kind of co-requisite support model operates similar to a learning community. So um, that helps create a supportive and collaborative environment um, by essentially building in a tutoring session within the class. Uh, next, we learned that colleges had a lot of work to do to ensure that their scheduling and course design was student friendly. Um, so when, when it came to actually registering for these um, uh, co-recs or support courses, many colleges used a linked registration process. Um, so if a student enrolled in the core course, they were automatically enrolled in the co-requisite course. Um, and logistically, they also tried to schedule the co-rec so it occurred right before or right after the main lecture um, to create a more seamless transition. So students really looked at the support course as kind of an extension of the regular classroom activities. And then lastly, colleges um, are offering comprehensive support services that are more holistic in nature. So um, reaching out to students in many capacities uh, using bridge programs, early alert systems, um, tutoring and hands-on support in math and writing centers, and also uh, embedded coaches in the classroom. So some of what you heard from colleges included things like, uh, we need to create a positive environment for students. Um, we need them to believe they can do it. We need to promote a growth mindset for the students and the faculty. We need to put an emphasis on this and change the culture. And this was from a Dean of Institutional Research Planning and Effectiveness. Um, we also heard, um, we know that uh, we know what's in our support courses, what's being offered, and what type of support they're getting. So when we meet with students, we're able to communicate that to them. Um, they know exactly what's going to be taught and what type of support is going to be given to them to be successful. And this is coming from a counselor. So um, this particular individual played an integral uh, part in their guided self-placement process on campus um, and served as a resource for students in getting connected to the right type of support. All right, our last focus area had to do with how colleges are addressing equity gaps. Um, we know that equity is one of the most important discussions taking place at colleges today. So we wanted to understand what colleges were doing to narrow those equity gaps. And what we heard from colleges is that uh, AB 705 has improved both access and success in transfer level math and English for students who otherwise would have been placed in developmental courses. However, um, we also learned that the fundamental equity gaps persist, you know, despite improvements seen at many institutions. Um, so that might seem a little counterintuitive given that we just said access and outcomes are improving. Um, and this is because when we look at the data, uh, what we're seeing is that um, there, there are improvements within student groups, um, but the gaps between groups are still there. Um, 
So given that these gaps still persist, colleges are investing more time and resources to increase their support and intervention, um, specifically for underperforming students. So what we heard from colleges were things like, we are seeing incredibly bright and talented students who would have uh, um, assessed into basic skills. They now have access to transfer level English. Um, opening access is really making students feel hopeful about being able to transfer sooner and attain their goals sooner. Um, we also heard what we would see is rising success rates for all students. So everyone was improving uh, and the percentage point gaps were often um, still there. And so that goes back to what I was just mentioning on the earlier slide that while um, you know, overall there is an increase in access and improvement in student outcomes, um, those percentage point gaps uh, that identify disproportionately impacted groups are still there. We also heard the disparity in education across student populations is apparent. Equity is a top priority for the college, but they have a long way to go. Uh, so the bottom line um, for many colleges we spoke to is that there has been substantial progress, um, but there's still more work to be done in the area of equity. All right, so now um, we are going to share um, the recommendations that the RP group put together based on the findings from these interviews um, for colleges to improve their AB 705 implementation in ways that result in um, increased student success and a reduction in equity gaps. Uh, so the first thing is to ensure that equity is a key consideration in every decision. So colleges reported how they're working to achieve equity by making it a component of major conversations and decisions on campus. Um, but other ways equity can be addressed includes faculty professional development um, and providing instructors with the additional skills to teach students of all backgrounds and capacities. Um, second, uh, to address faculty and staff concerns. Um, so while this research revealed um, that many faculty have embraced the idea of moving students more rapidly into transfer level coursework. Um, a su substantial number um, remain reluctant to fully buy into AB 705. And so in order to increase that buy in, um, it's important to take these concerns seriously and work to address them. Um, and so one way you can do that is to gather and disseminate data both locally at the college level and then statewide. Um, that demonstrates the effectiveness of AB 705 strategies to help increase that buy-in. Also making professional development available to all faculty, including part-time faculty, this was already um, mentioned earlier, uh, but numerous interviewees noted that changes to curriculum, to the support services offered at the college, uh, and just kind of the educational structures overall required faculty to do things that um, may not have been within their current set of skills. Um, so for this reason, professional development is necessary to support faculty who are either teaching more advanced courses or um, to prepare them to teach a more diverse student population with um, uh, more diversity in terms of their preparedness. Um, also streamlining processes to make them simple, uh, accessible and student-centered. Um, so it's important for colleges to look at their systems and procedures from a student perspective. Um, and one way you can do this is to actually um, have faculty or staff test the new processes um, by playing the role of the student. So seeing themselves um, in that process and being able to identify any uh, issues that emerge. Also collecting and analyzing feedback related to AB 705 to understand how it can be improved. So um colleges uh need to work to ensure that um, they have kind of ongoing and robust feedback um, to validate whether the changes um, they're implementing are successful and if there's any kind of refinement necessary um, and this also involves bringing in um, kind of the voice of students faculty and staff experiences uh, regarding these implementation changes um, 
We would also say that it's important to facilitate communication and collaboration among faculty uh, within and across disciplines. So many interviewees noted that this was actually one of the most positive benefits from um, kind of the process of implementation uh, and that it increased communication and collaboration um, among staff. So that was kind of a positive outcome and also um, a recommendation moving forward. One way you can do this is to um, kind of uh, bring departments together to review data, um, discuss what is working, what is not working, um, bringing different departments together to brainstorm strategies and highlight successes. Um, next, uh, we recommend devoting resources to making meaningful data available um, campus-wide in a timely manner. And so one of the most universal comments that emerged from the interviews was a desire for more data. When we conducted the interviews, it was still fairly um, preliminary data findings, but um, colleges are really utilizing data to evaluate and validate um, the changes taking place at their campus. Um, so it's important for colleges to devote resources to support their research offices um, so they can con continue to gather information um, and also be able to share that information uh, institution-wide in a digestible manner. Um, also supporting a shift in culture that highlights students' college readiness. Um, so we noticed that the colleges that made the most progress to date in terms of implementing AB 705 reported this shift on their campuses uh, away from a deficit mindset and towards a growth mindset. Um, so colleges can be more strategic uh, in creating this cultural shift by making sure students know that their institution has faith in them and believes they can thrive. And then lastly, um, commit at all levels to equitable placement and closing equity gaps. So it's important for colleges to know that equitable placement and closing equity gaps uh, requires long-term commitment, um, especially for those colleges who may be experiencing initiative fatigue, um, really colleges need sufficient time to understand what is working, to change what is not working, and to evaluate that, um, those changes. And so some of that will come from support at the state level, um, but also lo locally, just understanding that this is a long-term commitment uh, to equitable placement. All right, so, um, at this time, we would really love to hear from those on the call what your initial thoughts are, uh, reactions to the research. Uh, was there anything that stood out to you, surprised you, maybe reinforced what you've observed at your own college? Um, we put together a jam board uh, so you can share something you heard today that you found interesting or might be helpful for your college to know. Um, and Tara is going to go ahead and put the link to the Jamboard in the chat. And I'm actually going to share my screen so we can kind of look at this collectively in real time to see um, what everyone has to say in terms of feedback and kind of your reactions to the qualitative study. So because we have some time, uh, so I put the link in, in the chat. And we have a few different Jamboards that folks can add. Um, feedback to. So we want to hear from you because we only got to um, interview 14 colleges across the state. We would love to hear what's going on at your colleges. So we have um, a couple different, I don't know if folks are familiar with Jamboards or not, but if you click the link in the chat, uh, the first thing you'll see um, is a blank sheet that says positive outcomes of AB 705 implementation at your college. And so we wanna hear from folks. And so on the left-hand column, when you're in the Jamboard, there's a white square that says sticky note. So if you click that, then you can uh, create a sticky note and drop something onto the Jamboard. Um, and at the top of the screen, we have, you can um, pan through the different Jamboards that we have. And so they align with, um, five of our six research areas. So what were the positive outcomes of AB, AB 705 implementation at your college is the first one. Uh, the second one is about challenges that you encountered um, at the college. 
the third GM board is about how are you supporting students in transfer level in transfer level um, at your college? Um, how is your college addressing equity gaps? Um, and our final one uh, is what Michelle brought up and um, what was something that you found interesting uh, during today's presentation or helpful that you might be able to bring back to your college. So we want to give people a little bit of time to put some responses up. Uh, you don't have to add something to all of the, each one of the screens, but if you can contribute to um, a couple of them, things that come to mind through your implementation efforts, uh, we'll give people a few minutes to do that and then we'll start looking at um, what everyone is saying. And I'm just going to do a quick demo of the sticky tool that we're referring to. So if you go over here to the left uh, side of your screen, there should be a navigation tab that has all of these different tools. If you just click the sticky tool, it should bring up an option to just type directly into the sticky um, to respond to the prompt. So uh, maybe I will put uh, current support and wraparound services are key to and then you just hit save. And so you can see it just um, pop that sticky right on there and you can move that sticky and enlarge it uh, as needed. And then these are the slides up above that allow you to um, kind of move through the different questions we have here. Looks like we're getting some good responses on here. I'm going to read some of the ones for positive outcomes. Um, so one college says smaller equity gaps, no real decrease in course success rates and faculty collaboration as positive outcomes of AB 705 implementation. Um, we have in the orange sticky note, increased throughput for students and collaboration for faculty, but also increased conversations about systemic inequity and how to be more student-centered. We have another college that said teamwork and positive collaboration for the most part. Uh, let's see, more interest and demand for data. I like that. Uh, increased access and access for all students. Um, overall throughput rates improved, but racial equity gaps persist. Um, another college said more sections of transfer level courses available for students aimed at their learning needs. Uh, Citrus College has seen a great increase of Calculus 1 and Calculus 2 enrollment due to more students having access and success in pre-calculus with co-requisite support. Uh, smaller equity gaps in our college now works as a team. I love it. Well, we do too. And let's we have another one, Citrus College. We're also seeing more faculty starting to get on the AB705 bandwagon. Better understanding the benefits of co-requisite and just-in-time support for our math students. Okay, looks like we've got another new one. We are still looking at new methods to help students. Math teachers have set up new college-level courses some instructors experimented with embedded tutors. We have Summer Bridge that are also looking for better tutoring practices, mainly in the online environment. Great. 
So feel free to keep adding to the positive outcomes. I'm going to pan to the um, next slide over. And uh, Michelle, if you want to read off some of the greatest challenges. Sure. We got a lot here. This usually tends to be the most um, robust discussion. So <laughs> um, let's see, getting faculty buy-in, especially counselors for special groups. Um, yeah, that was a, a big one we heard in the study as well, just kind of getting everyone on the same page and supporting um, the implementation efforts. Then students have very limited time for, me, for remediation. This is working against underprepared students, especially students of color. This seems to lead to fewer minority, oh, we just, fewer minority students in STEM. Mm -hmm. Many of our faculty express the difficulties in teaching younger students. Before AB 705, almost all students in transfer level courses were in their 20s and had passed at least one developmental course in the subject. Now they have students fresh from high school, which required more classroom management and other instructional skills that were not as necessary with older students. This was about classroom management, not students' preparation in the subject. Interesting. Um, yeah, a lot has um, gone into uh, kind of the pedagogy and learning strategies for um, instruction uh, over a more diverse student population and students who might um, be coming in with um, different levels of preparedness um, or just different levels of kind of college experience. So, um, you know, newer to the whole um, concept of uh, how to be a good college student in terms of study skills, note taking skills, um, seeking out the necessary supports and resources to be successful. Uh, let's see how to encourage nudge students to re enroll in math or English courses they didn't pass or re enroll in the uh, next in the sequence course. So that's a really interesting one. Now that we have kind of some of that data to indicate which students are um, not successfully passing the course, I'd be curious if anyone wants to put in the chat um some strategies to help students um, who did not successfully complete math or english at transfer level to to re-enroll or to enroll in the subsequent course um, feel free to drop that in the chat uh, and to answer the question in the chat will this um will you keep this jamboard online today yes and um i will find out because we can definitely pdf this jamboard if we can uh, distribute it out to the participants who registered for the webinar so um, i will see if we can make that possible we'll clean it up a little bit before we uh, distribute it let's see one issue is aligning mmap with 8705 for example, ESL students are automatically placed in a transfer level English course. There are no parameters to pass down to the college to indicate if the student is ESL, um, ELD to implement any local rules. Interesting. Uh, another funding challenges for our faculty, full-time and adjunct, community of practice, um, SEAP funded professional development, soft money. Yeah, that's always um, a big challenge for colleges is finding the support and funding um, our college still needs to provide more robust career and major exploration to students as soon as possible because their math placement depends on their major. Very, um, very good point. Yeah, kind of de deciding whether or not they're going into a BSTEM math course or a SLAM course, um, they have to decide much sooner um, if they're to complete that transfer level math course within the first year of entering college. Let's see, for the sake of time, I think I'm actually, there's a lot here, but I wanna move on to the next um, question just to get to some of those. Um, Tara, did you want to read off some of the comments so far? Sure. Sure, for um, <clears throat> this one, we wanna know how you are supporting students um, in transfer level at your college. So we have a college using co Corrects and supplemental instruction. Uh, another college says corrects for all entry level math courses, um, including a new course in liberal arts math, uh, non credit option, non credit optional support courses coming soon. Um, corrects with the same instructor as the lecture section. Uh, so in our report. Um, we kind of talk about that as sort of a, a learning community sort of model. 
uh, with the co-rec linked to the main section, uh, the same students in both sections and the same instructor. Um, we've got embedded tutoring, uh, shared Canvas modules designed to successfully onboard students in their transfer level English classes, uh, community building, growth mindset. Um, faculty are creating culturally relevant and responsive math and English curriculum. Cool. Um, let's see. Some embedded tutoring, more co-requisite support. Uh, here we go. Co-requisite courses for about half of our sections. Um, we have embedded tutors, expanded tutoring, metacognition, and study skills in content courses. Cool. So we'll move to the next one and look at how colleges um, are addressing some of the equity gaps. So this is always the time. Um, it looks like uh, someone put they created a student equity committee in our math department. Haven't yet had our first meeting, but it seemed important given the persistence of equity gaps. Definitely um, curious if um, that committee exists for English or ESL or um, how that's kind of organized at your college for other subjects. Uh, professional development around culturally responsive pedagogy, watching data, having faculty data analysis sessions um, of their own data, uh, co-recs, other support like non-credit, supplemental instruction, tutoring. Um, definitely, I've, I've heard that more and more from colleges that um, there's greater faculty involvement um, in not just kind of institutional data, but also what's happening within their own courses. So making that um, more granular level data available to faculty. Uh, we are growing an equity librarian position to support faculty and students in construction of courses, research, and learning. Oh, very interesting. I've never heard of a role like that on campus, equity librarian. Uh, our Equity-Minded Teaching and Learning Institute was inspired by our English department's equity work after they realized structural changes were not enough, definitely. Um, curious if um, how, how you determine that um, the structural changes were not enough. What type of evaluation um, did you use to examine uh, those changes? Was it your quantitative, maybe student outcomes or student feedback? Um, Curious about that. Uh, working on culturally relevant teaching techniques, um, hiring tutors and faculty who look more like our students, definitely. Um, kind of the representation um, in the college workforce uh, goes a long way with students if they feel, you know, kind of um, their backgrounds and experiences are reflected in, um, especially the instructional faculty on campus. Outreach and inreach to students who attempted but did not successfully complete transfer level. That's a big one, especially now that we're going into um, semesters where we're seeing maybe students who are not successfully passing. How do we um, reach out to them and um, keep them on track? Student focus groups to explore student perceptions of classroom climate, instructor support, et cetera. Yeah, that's a big one. I've seen a lot of student surveys um, kind of administered, but focus groups are a little bit few and far between. I know that they um, take a little bit more time and resources to develop. I'm curious if other colleges are also using focus groups as a way to uh, capture student voice. All right, let's go to the next one. So just in terms of one thing you heard today that you found interesting or might be helpful for your college to know, um, this, that's good. <laughs> let's see what this says. Uh, just because we have implemented AB 705, we shouldn't think our work is done. Very true. Uh, we need to continue to monitor how our students are doing and offer professional development across the disciplines to help all of our students succeed. Um, yeah, very well said. I think um, oftentimes colleges kind of know what needs to take place. It's sort of working out all of the moving parts and having the resources and support necessary to accomplish those things that gets to be difficult. Um, revisiting our bridge program. Bridge used to help students get through the remedial math English pipelines. Now the semester to semester cohort model seems like it needs re-envisioning. Interesting, okay. Um, Concurrent support and wraparound services. Oh, that's the one that I put our key to success. 
let's see. Seeing that the persistent equity gap still exists across the state means we can have more informed conversations and sessions like this to really tackle this, AB 705 and beyond. Very true. Um, I think sometimes it's um, good to see that uh, other colleges are experiencing similar um, outcomes. And so not just understanding that that exists, but also what are some um, approaches or um, strategies you can use to, um, to address those uh, challenges. Um, effectiveness of default placement rules, good to know. Yeah, um, we were, it was interesting to me to see how many colleges, um, at least those that were part of the study, went with the default placement rules. I don't know um, how consistent that is across the state. I haven't looked at the statewide data. Um, if you want, feel free to drop in um, what your college is using in the chat. I'm just curious uh, for those on the call if that's um, pretty consistent, or if some of you went with the localized rules, um, and if you chose localized, what was some of the rationale behind doing that? Structural changes only get us so far, definitely. It's, it kind of goes back to that cultural shift um, that needs to take place across the institution. It's not just kind of the infrastructure and systems, it's really the attitude and um, buy-in that is necessary to um, you know, see a fully successful implementation effort. Uh, let's see, do we have one more? I think that was it. Um, so as I mentioned, I will um, do my best to put this all together in a kind of final PDF. So anyone who's on the call has access to this Jamboard, and you can kind of take this away um, from the webinar, uh, our gift to you, if you're interested in revisiting any of the comments shared today um, on the call. With that, I want to stop sharing very quickly and go back to our PowerPoint. So while Michelle's pulling that up, um, I dropped a couple links in the chat. Uh, the first link um, per, give, takes you to the landing page that uh, she's going to show a screenshot of here. So for the RP group and the multiple measures assessment project, um, we have some resources to support equitable placement implementation at your college. Uh, so I dropped that link on there so you can see all of the resources. And then I also dropped a direct link to the full report um, where you can read about all of our findings um, and recommendations in detail. And uh, we'd love to hear feedback as colleges start um, using the report and um, reviewing the, the recommendations. And, and we can't wait to hear what you think about it. And so, um, um, with, yeah, we just have a few minutes left. Um, we just want to thank you all for joining us on the webinar today. Um, we appreciate you taking the time out of your day to learn about the findings from this study. Um, we're going to stay on for just a few more minutes. If you have any final questions or thoughts you'd like to share, feel free to unmute yourself or drop a um, question or a comment in the chat box. Um, with that, I hope everyone has a great day and stay safe out there. Uh, and yeah, Tara and I will be on the call for a little bit longer should you have any questions or final remarks. Yes, thank you for joining us. And we want to thank if any of our participants from the study, any of our interviewees are on the call. Uh, we want to thank all of you and the 14 colleges that uh, participated in this uh, research project. We really appreciate it. Yes, echo those sentiments. I see some familiar faces as well. So thank you for joining us. I'm so glad that you were able to see kind of the fruit of our labors and um, we very much appreciate you guys uh, taking part in this research study. Michelle, it's Darla. Um, Claudia asked a question a while ago when you were talking about the change in mindset that was, that was happening on some college campuses. I don't, I don't, if you answered it, I, and I just maybe spaced out for that moment, but she was asking if we had any insights into what was leading to that change in, in people's insights, I'm sorry, in their mindsets. 
Oh, okay. Thank you for bringing that up. I didn't realize that question went unanswered. So I think um, in terms of kind of shifting that mindset, uh, something that can go a long way with that is um, being able to demonstrate kind of the effectiveness of the changes that came about um, from AB 705. Um, and so that really comes from looking at the data, um, being able to, I think, share um, the student outcomes and um, any kind of narrowing and equity gaps that colleges are observing. I feel like that really uh, goes a long way to reinforce that, you know, this um, legislation makes sense and that it's serving students more equitably than um, our, our past placement procedure. So um, that would be one thing I would advise uh, if, you know, colleges are struggling to make that shift happen. And then also, you know, kind of sitting in on professional development um, activities such as this, and then, you know, any other workshops or um, sessions where they can learn from other colleges and, and what's happening and, and hear success stories. Thank you. I, I know I saw her question and I was like, wait, I wanna know that. <laughs> it's a very good question. I feel like that's a, a tough, issue to tackle. Um, were there any other questions? Let's see. I think that was it. Well, if you have other questions that come up after the webinar, feel free to email uh, Michelle or myself, and um, we will do our best to answer any other questions you have, or if you have questions that come up uh, while reading the full report, uh, we'd love to hear from you and, and help answer some of your questions. With that, I say thank you to everybody who spent the last hour with us. We appreciate it. All righty, I'm going to go ahead and close out our session. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you.